We are excited to be joined by an author with more than 50 years experience in ministry, David J. Randall. Welcome and thanks for joining us, David. Thank you. Good morning and uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you. Oh, thank you, David. Before we get stuck into the questions, feel free just to take a moment to introduce yourself. Yeah, well, I'm uh, a retired uh, minister now. I'm now 77 years old. I know I don't look it, <laughs> but um, was felt the call of God quite early in life into ministry and, and went into the Church of Scotland ministry. I was a uh, parish minister in one congregation for 39 years, which is unusual nowadays. Yep. Uh, retired in 2010. And uh, then after that, because of all sorts of controversies within the Church of Scotland, uh, and we'll maybe speak about that later, uh, I left the Church of Scotland and uh, joined the Free Church of Scotland and have uh, since been involved in a lot of um, preaching ministry in, in different churches around the area in Scotland here and writing as well. And uh, I'm married. We have uh, um, two sons who are both pastors, actually, um, one in Falkirk and one in Larbert in uh, the central part of Scotland and one married daughter. Uh, lost a son who died in, in middle age some years ago, and we have six grandchildren, one of whom is just about to be married quite soon. Oh, well, well there's plenty to be keeping you busy, David, right? Indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> you you yeah. just touched on it a few moments ago. What is the spiritual temperature like in Scotland at the moment? It's, it's very confused uh, in many ways. and I mean, socially, the climate in Scotland is very liberal just now. And uh, I don't know if you, how much has been broadcast in uh, in the south about the resignation or the announcement of the resignation of the first minister here this week, um, which is an interesting uh, situation because um, she she denies it, but it's really her uh, stand on this uh, gender recognition bill. Most people think which has actually caused her downfall, which is interesting. Uh, because she she has been very liberal in all sorts of ways over the years, um, and has been committed to this transgenderism thing. Famously, has been refusing to say whether a certain person is a man or a woman uh, for fear of contradicting her own yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> bill. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing is that she's had to resign uh, in that in the light of what might be a certain degree of popular opposition. And yet, on the other hand, one of the principal contenders to be her successor is a committed Christian uh, young young woman. And it's been widely reported that she probably is the favourite, but her religious views may stymie her, may prevent her. So yeah. interesting yeah. contrast there um, between the, the kind of attitude of many of the public and and probably the political and media classes who uh, dominate so much of life and who who are quite unrepresentative, uh, as I think we all know. Yeah, well, we're, so we're certainly living. Yeah. We're certainly living in an interesting time, aren't we, David? Yes, indeed. And and church wise in Scotland, um, as as in England, in fact, the the national church, the Church of Scotland, um, although constitutionally orthodox. Um, has really been on a, a drift over many years now, and uh, or particularly over same-sex marriage has um, gone with the zeitgeist of the times, really, and and that has that's what led quite a number of us to depart from the Church of Scotland. And uh, within the Free Church, there is growth. There are a number of church plants in different parts of Scotland. And and of course a number of small fellowships in various places that uh, that, that soldier on, you know, and, and seek to do their their bit. So it's a very mixed picture, the, yeah. the spiritual climate in the country. I think yeah. sounds very similar to to down south, David. Yes. David, you're here today to talk about your new book published by the brilliant Banner of Truth, mm -hmm. the Gospel According to Christ's Enemies. G give us an overview of your new book, David. Yes, uh, the, the subtitle of it is Unintended Statements of, of uh, Saving Truth. And it takes up a number of uh, instances in the Gospels where people 
said things that were critical of Jesus, but which, in fact, turned out to be true. I mean, I think the most notable example is the, the criticism, um, this man welcomes sinners, which they meant as, a, as an attack. But actually, it's, it's wonderfully true. Yeah. Uh, it's our only hope that this man welcomes sinners. And I suppose the other notable instance would be Caiaphas with his word uh, when he said, it's more expedient that this one man should die than the whole nation perish. And and uh, actually, in, in Scripture, John draws attention to the fact that he said he, he spoke truth unwittingly, you know, because it was more expedient yeah. indeed. It was God's plan that one man should die to save the people. Yeah. So that's the, the idea. It was taken up these... Uh, critical statements which unintentionally expressed the truth. And and I, I've added a little bit at the end about uh, contemporary instances of the same thing. Yeah, brilliant. Well, what an excellent idea. So, so let, let's start at the beginning, David. Who were Christ's enemies and how did they become so? I suppose the, the principal enemies of Christ really were the religious establishment, the leaders of the nation at the time. Um, in, in another sense, we, we can actually say that we are all naturally God's enemies. I mean, the, the Bible says that, doesn't it? That we are by nature enemies of God and the truth. But uh, in the particular circumstances of Jesus' ministry, it was largely the religious, the Jewish authorities who were his enemies. And I suppose they became so because they, Jesus didn't fit the mold of what they thought the the messiah if and when the messiah came would would be like as for the the political uh, overlords the romans um actually I, in many ways the new testament gives a reasonably positive view of the roman authorities um it was after new testament times of course we get to the throwing Christians to the to the lions, you know, and, and the arena things and so on. Uh, that, that developed at a later time. But uh, it's interesting. For example, uh, the, the number of uh, centurions who are mentioned in the Bible, in, in the New Testament, most of them are mentioned quite positively. So they were not so much his enemies um, as, as the Jewish leaders were, and, and it really was their wrong expectations, even yeah. with... Yeah as I think I put in the book somewhere, even with Isaiah 53 in their hands. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they didn't see it. They couldn't see that the Messiah would be a suffering servant. Yeah, 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 so true. So what was Jesus' approach when interacting with those that hated him? And how can we apply that in our own lives today, David? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's um, he, he, on the one hand, he was very direct. Uh, when he confronted the religious authorities, especially, very direct. I mean, whitewashed tombs, you know, uh, right. tombs covered with paint to, to whitewash them, but inside full of dead men's bones. And uh, he, he was very direct in many instances. On the other hand, he was also loving. Um, I think I quoted somewhere, there's an old hymn that uh, talks about how, what is it, uh, unwearied in forgiveness, still thy heart could only love. And uh, he did show love to people, even in uh, opposition to him. And, and of course, notably, ultimately, even on the cross. I mean, Father, forgive them, for yeah. they know not what they do. That's that's what he said about his enemies, people who were putting them to death. Yeah. And, and, yeah, you said uh, how we can learn from that for today. Well, same thing, I think. We, we need uh, that combination somehow of... Honest, straightforward talk, not being mealy mouthed, and at the same time love for people that we're trying to reach, and and that's a, that's not an easy combination, but I think we do have to combine these two things of of honest, straight talk, and real love toward other people. Yeah, yeah. One of the criticisms of Jesus was his association with sinners. Tell tell us about that, David. Yes, yes, the, that was uh, the the, uh, defen the the definition of the word sinners. Of course, I, I sometimes feel uh, in these texts that the the word might be put in inverted commas, <laughs> because although we're we're all sinners, 
obviously yeah. that's true but uh, it was really the kind of snide attitude of the the religious people then that regarded the common riffraff as just sinners that weren't worth spending time on um so uh, yeah jesus uh, had plenty of time for sinners of course um yeah i've forgotten what you actually asked the, what the question was again um, well, well no exactly that the, the accusation was that he was spending his time with sinners uh, it, it takes us to the next point isn't it so, so how bearing this in mind that jesus spent so much time you know with with these people who were seen um you know by their self-righteous as, as sinners how should this mindset shape our evangelism today i think it means that we we do have to be involved in in the with people basically i i it's not so long ago that we had what we called a lockdown and it's quite an interesting illustration really uh, a lockdown or any kind of quarantine is put in place to prevent the spread of an infection, COVID in, in that case. Um, now, that's the way to prevent the spread of something, would be in, in these terms that we're speaking of now, to have Christians all gathered into their own, as they say, holy huddles, you know, and, yeah, and just yeah. keeping themselves to themselves, never interacting with the world. That would be one way of preventing the spread of the gospel. So I think it means that, uh, like the Lord himself, we have to be ready to be out there and, and to be involved in, in the world at large, um, to, to be even involved in, in, you know, meeting people in social situations and so on, to have the opportunities to, to be witnesses. Yeah, yeah. But there was a, a, a Scottish evangelist uh, once, a man called D.P. Thompson, who compiled a little booklet on how, how I found Christ. Uh, and he, he, he found, I think, I think it was 11 people that he highlighted, and 10 of them, he said, said that the way in which they came to Christ was through the influence of a friend. Which is interesting, isn't it? I mean, it's, uh, um, yeah. it's not very encouraging for preachers. <laughs> <laughs> right or writers for that matter um, yeah, yeah. maybe not yeah. so many people uh, come uh, uh, i suppose we should say the initial contact really would be the the personal one with a the friend first step. yeah the first step and i think that's uh, if we we can't have that influence on people if we're not actually involved with people getting to know people difficult as it is as i think we're all in the position now where we're I, I, I suppose we're we're greatly afraid of putting people off. You know, if I say too much, if I try and push too much, I'll put people's backs up and you know, that kind of holds us back really, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we're and going back to the previous yeah. mm. And going back to your previous point as well, David, when we're then in those situations, we, we have to tell the truth as well right it's not been a situation of oh they're not going to yeah. like the gospel they don't want to you know it's not them watering it down or, or 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 being afraid to talk about the truth then in those situations right? Yeah, right and and of course that applies very much to the social issues of the times now yeah uh, i think it's somewhere i think it was the writer uh, jewish writer melanie phillips who, who talked about uh, the whole issue of uh, uh, same-sex issues uh, and and now transgenderism all these sort of things are the the point where the rubber hits the road nowadays and where where christianity is 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 under attack really and it cannot be the answer to to sort of say oh well we've just got to change you know that's the tragedy of yeah. denominational life that the the large denominations or many of them are really tending to go with the flow fit in with the the, the mores of the time or what seems at least to be the the, the popular view yeah. and, and abandon the harder bits of, of biblical truth that can't yeah. be right i mean we, we have to hold to what is laid down what is revealed to yeah. us uh, and at the yeah. same time, seek to build bridges. Yeah, yeah. 
It yeah. seems to be the fruit of the, the postmodern world we live in, doesn't it? Where where truth has become subjective and people are only too willing to cheer, you know, everybody on um, regarding what they say is true for them, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your truth, my truth, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. One of the things that made Christ stand out was the way in which he spoke. This drew two very different reactions. Tell us about that, David. Yes, um, people reacted in, in all manner of ways against uh, against uh, uh, Jesus. Some some hated him and and, and hated uh, the, the way that he spoke. And I've suggested earlier, in many cases, because of vested interests, um, they wanted to hold power. The, the religious leaders really they, they were more concerned with holding power than than seeking the truth i think that's probably the the the, the issue and still today many people as as we've just been saying hate the truth they don't want to hear the truth as as we would say uh, but then others responded to the lord and uh, it was wonderful i i often reflect on the fact you know in john's gospel uh, in two consecutive chapters you've got Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman two people who could hardly have been more different from each other socially religiously morally in every way uh, and and there they are one chapter after the other Nicodemus comes to Jesus and uh, well <laughs> the, the chapter doesn't actually say he was born again then uh, it leaves it kind of open-ended but perhaps from later events, we can uh, guess at least and hope <laughs> that the Nicodemus was indeed born again. And then the woman of Samaria, who had her uh, uh, very different kind of background, five marriages behind her, cohabitation with a guy then, um, outcast in many ways. Yeah. And yet the Lord had time for her. And and she responded and, and eventually was rushing back yeah. to the village, as we read, yeah. then come and see this man, come and see him for yourself. So yeah. there were the people who, who responded uh, joyfully and gladly. Zacchaeus from his wee position up the tree. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. Well, yeah. That, I mean, Zacchaeus and, and Matthew, the tax collector as well, who, who would have been despised by an awful lot of people but not by jesus and uh, yeah. I, I was quoting the other day actually uh, there's, a, there's a lovely telling of the story of zacchaeus where it talks about it's a children's telling of the story where uh, jesus has called him down from the tree and he's walking along the road towards zacchaeus's house for tea and it says and zacchaeus felt 10 feet tall as he walked <laughs> right. yeah. like a lovely phrase, isn't it? Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I, I sometimes wonder, there is talk, as, as you'll know, um, about spiritual search today. And I've often wondered how apt is that? You know, people would want to say behind all the razzmatazz and all the noise and bustle, there is a spiritual search going on. Yeah. I think it's yeah. possible to over stress that and and maybe maybe be too hopeful in, in a sense. But we are taught that um well, the Lord has put eternity in the human heart. So there there is something there. You know, Augustine's yeah. famous yeah. phrase that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. So yeah. you know, there there are people that are ready in a sense to hear the good news yeah and he is sovereign and knows exactly what he's doing as well david right yes. so yes yeah. indeed thank you for that yeah yeah, yeah. and the word some gospel, were expected sorry the word david. Gospel, as, as we know means good news uh, so yeah. it's uh, yeah um, that's my title the gospel according to christ's enemies the good news yeah according to his enemies that's wonderful yeah yeah some were expecting the Messiah to come as a political figure. When these expectations were not met, how did those in authority view Jesus and what impact did it have on the gospel? Yes, yes, we've been partly touching on that already. That that, that was really what led them to reject Jesus and mount more and more of a campaign against him. Um, some of the parables that he told, they, they got the point 
<laughs> they realized <laughs> what, what Jesus was saying, um, and uh, that led to their growing opposition, uh, uh, trying to inveigle, well, the Romans like Pilate into uh, condemning Jesus. Um, and of course, we know they, they kind of changed tack, didn't they? From uh, they didn't say to Pilate, we don't think he fits our Old Testament. They said to Pilate, uh, anyone who claimed, who, you know, what was it, the, the phrase, um, anyone who defies Caesar is a danger to Rome. I, that's not exactly how they put it, but anyone who defies Caesar is a threat to Rome. That was how they hoped to get Pilate on board, which, of course, they did. Poor man, yeah. as he was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Some of Jesus' enemies taunted him as he lay hung upon the cross, asking him why didn't he use his supposed supernatural power, whilst mm. others mocked him for not saving himself. What was going on here, and what does this tell us about Christ? It's, it's, that, that is one of the chapters, that's one of the sayings that I've taken up in the book. Um, he saved others, he cannot save himself. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course, that is the gospel according to Christ's enemies. He did save others. And although he could have, he didn't save himself. He saved others. It was because, in fact, somebody said it's because Christ did not come down from the cross that we believe in him. We believe that he plumbed the depths, that he went right through the, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It went right to the, to the depths for, for our salvation. And when he said, when they said uh, he cannot save himself, obviously they meant he's pinned to that tree, he's nailed there, he can't do anything to save himself. His own response was, well, he he, he could have called down twelve legions of angels. Yeah, right. was that uh, uh, seventy-two thousand angels, which was quite a thought. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But but he didn't. You know, he 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 could he saved others. He can't save himself. In one sense, you say he can't save himself because that's God's eternal plan, um, that, that he would go to the cross and be the substitute, the ransom price. It's one of yeah. his famous sayings, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's, yeah. uh, that's why we believe in him. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Amen. Another enemy of Christ was Saul of Tarsus. Tell mm. us about what we can learn about God's mercy and grace as you talk us through Paul's story, like you do in the book, David. Yeah, Paul's story is an, an amazing story. I, I sometimes have said, if if we had seen and heard Paul on the day before the Damascus Road, right. we would all have said, "Oh, there's somebody that will never ever become a Christian. Right. Never be a no chance." Um, and yet we know what happened, uh, and and his whole life was turned around on that uh, Damascus Road, that wonderful day. Um, what was it? He he came to say eventually, um, in what I think in many ways could be taken as his life text, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life I now live I li in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And that uh, that last phrase, I think, probably was said with great depth and feeling because I'm sure Paul could never get over it. He loved me and gave himself for me, the one who had been an arch enemy of the gospel. He, he, he said later on that he'd, uh, wherever he went, he tried to get... Christians to blaspheme against Christ. He, he, he was so intent on rooting out what he saw as this dreadful heretical sect. Uh, and then, of course, his whole attitude turned around. And he must have been a, a dynamo of a man, I think, full of energy and, and drive. And uh, we, we can be so thankful for the life of the Apostle Paul, because he was the one that uh, ensured the spreading of the gospel and, and ultimately even into Europe 
as 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 the gospel spread further and further. So it's a it's a, a wonderful story, um, the the life of Paul, and uh, it it does remind us that that we should never say of anybody they'll never be converted. Yeah, you know that nobody's beyond the pale because God's Amen. God's grace can reach down and 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 touch anyone we 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 don't know his purposes of course uh, but uh, but we can believe that he has the power to change even a soul of tarsus yeah so encouraging so encouraging yeah. throughout church history we see very early on that the church began to attract gospel distorters we think of the judaizers who wanted to add circumcision to the gospel in galatians what were these people trying to do and how does this show up today david um, the basic thing is trying to make uh, Christianity or religion more popular. Um, uh, well, in the case of uh, uh, Judaizers, of course, they were people who wanted to insist that, that Christianity would really be a sect of of Judaism, that, and and therefore circumcision was going to still be required. But uh, there's always that temptation. We touched on it earlier in regard to the mainline denominations, especially of the church. But there's always this temptation to try to make the gospel more palatable, more popular. And <laughs> in, in many ways, the answer to that is quite simple. It, it doesn't work. You know, it just doesn't work. Um we, we see that as, as we look around. If, if I mean, the churches that are seeking to accommodate the world in that way, are, are they growing and bustling and all the rest of it? I don't think so. It's the, the, the churches that maintain the truth that are the ones that are more likely to see growth and development. And in fact, a friend of mine uh, has recently said, it's a good question to ask people in general about the whole... You know the what you might call the project to de-Christianize the country. Just to ask them a simple question: How is it going then? Right. Yeah. And that is quite an interesting question, isn't it? To ask people to face up to the truth, yeah. because yeah. most people in the UK today, I think, uh, would agree that things are not as good as they should be in society generally. You know, there are an awful lot of. Uh, undesirable uh, qualities of life today and, and, and undesirable things that are happening. And is it just a coincidence that these things are increasingly so, there's an increasing flood of evil at the very time when society at large has been turning away from the gospel of Christ? Yeah. It's a good question to ask. How's it going? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 What is the gospel according to Christ's enemies today, David? Well, there, there are a number of things. I, I, I did, added a kind of uh, appendix to the book on that uh, subject of a number of ways in which people say things today which are meant to be critical, but in fact they, they are wonderfully true about the gospel. Um, um, for, for example, I think the first one that I took up was People say religion is the problem of the world, not the solution. And actually, we would, as Christians, we would really agree with that. In, in, the, in one sense, it's religion uh, that is the problem. And and, and we would main, go on, of course, to maintain that uh, um, Christianity is not a religion in the, in the normal sense. Or else people say, some people would say, oh, Christianity is just for simple people. Now, Again, it's true, Christianity is for the simplest person. Others say, oh, it's just for intellectuals. <laughs> and, uh, well, that's true as well. It is for intellectuals. You know, the, the, they're, they're expressing uh, gospel truth, even though they yeah. don't actually intend to, 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 to do so. And, and people, another one that people say is we, we need more of Jesus simple teaching as they would say about loving loving each other and all that and again um that's sometimes meant as an attack on doctrine you know on the theology 
and so on. But actually, I mean, we would agree we do need an awful lot more of Jesus' teaching. Of course, we need a lot more than that. But th these are perhaps uh, instances of some ways in which people mean to attack the gospel, but sometimes say things that they don't really intend to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really helpful. Mm. What would you say to someone that said that Christianity is a crutch? Uh, in personal uh, uh, experience, I might refer to a time when I, I, I used to be a, a, a runner. And I remember once I was running downhill and it put my, actually put my foot into a rabbit hole by mistake, tore ligaments and damaged my ankle quite badly. Uh, in fact, it had to be in plaster and, and I was out of action for quite some time. And I must say that during that time, I was very, very thankful for a crutch. You know, if you're injured, if there's something wrong, right then a crutch is a tremendously valuable thing. Of course, the, the issue becomes if people say Christianity is just a crutch, you know, just a crutch, meaning for emotionally inadequate people uh, and all that sort of thing, um, because it's not just a crutch, but actually um, it is a, a, the, the message is a, is a wonderful message of, of God's grace and help for people in all uh, circumstances of life come to me all who are weary and burdened and i will give you rest he said right you know so that uh, it is there it's not just a crutch but it is a wonderful message of his grace that is well we know the text my grace is sufficient for you for my strength is made perfect in weakness right yeah yeah what does the gospel have to say about christ's enemies it it, it, um, it it says in the first place that they're missing out on so much. I think that's one of the one of the main things that we would want to say. Missing out on a great deal. After all, Jesus said, "I have come that that you may have life and have it to the full, life in all its fullness." And we believe, don't we, that if people reject Christ, if people reject the gospel, then they are actually missing out on so much so that's one one aspect of uh, of an answer to that and and i suppose the other answer is that about christ's enemies they're, they're in danger they're in great danger and people don't like to hear that but uh, we we believe that there is coming a day when we all must give account after this life is over if not before then we must appear before the, the judgment seat of the Lord and give an account of our lives. And there is no doubt about it that the, the Bible teaches and Jesus more than anyone himself that there, there is not only a, a heaven beyond this life, but there is also a hell. Um, and judgment is coming. So for, for the enemies of the gospel, I think these are two things that we would want to say, that they are missing out on so much in terms of this world, but they're also in putting themselves in great danger uh, as, as regards the life to come. That's a, a solemn, solemn yeah. message. Yeah, yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you, David. We've spoken about the gospel according to Christ's enemies. What is the gospel according to Jesus Christ, David? Yeah, right. So there's uh, um, the, 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 the big question. I've, I've just quoted that saying, to he, he said, I have come that you may have life in all its fullness. That's one part of the answer. And earlier on, we referred to the text uh, when he said the Son of Man, which was his own preferred title for himself, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And that really is the gospel. I mean, many people, of course, know. I suppose it's the best known text in the whole Bible. John 3.16, wouldn't you say? God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the gospel according to Christ himself. Um, in many ways, encapsulated in that text. Although... Um, there are many others I listed towards the end of the book, listed some of the things that Jesus said 
which tell us about the, the gospel according to him himself. Uh, he, he came to save sinners, came into the world to save sinners. Um, isn't that at the end? Is that the end of the Zacchaeus story? Um, where he said the Son of Man um, uh, came to seek and to save the lost. That was his expression, to seek and to save the lost. And so the, the gospel according to Christ is the gospel of, of uh, wonderful good news, good news of forgiveness, which is an answer to our, our sin and our guilt, uh, good news of uh, uh, fulfillment in this life when when he has his rightful place in our at the center of our life, everything falls into place, and good news for the future as well, and not only the future in this world, but the the, the future beyond this world. Yeah. It really is a, an amazing message of good news. Yeah. If we have someone listening right now, David, who actually isn't a born again Christian, and they're wondering, well, how can this apply to me? You know, what do what do they need to do, David? The, 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 in the first place, of course, we need to. Anyone needs to face up to the fact that we are in in need of God's grace, amazing grace, as the, as, the, as that hymn says. Everybody knows the hymn, "Amazing Grace." I often say, uh, people sing it happily that saved a wretch like me, but just call them a wretch to their face and see what happens. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, we, we, we begin from that point of realising that we are not what we ought to be. Uh, Jesus said the, the principal things that God requires, he, you could sum it up, he said, in two things, love God with all that you have, love your neighbour as yourself. And, and we have to begin by admitting that we haven't done that. We haven't loved him and we haven't loved our neighbour as ourselves. So, that's the first thing to to realize our need of his salvation and then simply to pray to him to pray to him to 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 be my my savior my lord in in the assurance that the the gospel says he says whosoever will may come and he says whoever comes to me i will not cast out he he will he, he welcomes sinners. That's that's going back to that very first uh, uh, phrase that the enemies of Christ used. He welcomes sinners, which they meant as an, an attack, but it is gospel truth. He welcomes sinners. So for anyone who, who hasn't yet entered into that new life, who's not born again yet, that really is the great thing, to, to turn away from sin and self and to to say to the Lord, I want you to be my saviour for now and my Lord for the rest of my life and forever. Yeah, yeah. David, it, it was an absolute pleasure reading your book. It's been a, a really enjoyable half an hour speaking to you as, as well. And before we let you go, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, I think we've said most of the things. It, it's been a, a, a joy to write the, the book, actually to cover all these different uh, aspects of the, the truth, according to the Lord. Um, a slightly, perhaps, unusual take on the gospel message, the, the, the seeing it through the eyes of those who wanted to attack him, uh, but whose words were wonderfully true. Uh, actually, my, um, there's that old saying, many a true word. That, that was... That was actually my original uh, uh, draft title for the book. Many a true right. word, dot, 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 you know. Um, yeah. Actually, the, the editors uh, thought, well, I didn't really like that because, of course, it ends with the word jest. Many a true word spoken in jest. And uh, they didn't feel that there's anything jokey about the gospel message. Fair enough. Um, yeah. But... Uh, I, I think I also quoted in the, in the book somewhere that when when I was a youngster there was a phrase that people used to say if something if they said something that rhymed they would say oh I'm a poet and I didn't know it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that there, there are yeah. some people who who are prophets and they don't know it um, that doesn't rhyme but it's uh, it, it's true people have said things that they intended to be negative and critical. And in fact, they're they're wonderfully positive. So uh, I've enjoyed uh, writing this book, and I hope if people uh, read it, uh, that they'll enjoy reading it in the first place. Um, 
and that they'll find it uh, relevant to to our present circumstances and uh, in the case of people who are believers that it will increase our our love for the lord and devotion to him and if there are any who read it who are not believers my my great goal my great desire would be that it would open their eyes or, or should say that the lord would open their eyes through it to to uh, get into his word and to to really come to terms with and respond to the the gospel the good news yeah amen amen david wherever you're listening or watching um, this interview we're going to make sure that there's a link uh, in the description to banner of truth so that you can buy this book in fact whilst you're there you I, I can confidently say you can add any title from the banner of truth website and you'll be encouraged and blessed it's a an you know probably my favorite publisher everything that they they produce is, is outstanding and 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 really really helpful so do enjoy um browsing the banner of truth website um Especially david they, they they produce books that are are beautiful simply as books actually their standard yeah. of production is tremendous but as you say more importantly the the content the quality is what counts actually it was banner who published my earlier book uh which was called a sad departure and that was about the the departure from the, the Church of Scotland. It was it was Banner that published that, and it's been uh, widely widely read, uh, certainly in Scotland, and and I think beyond Scotland as well. Yeah. So, is it two books that you've written so far, David? Yeah. Well, that's the two two Banner books. I, I, I've yeah. written various other things for Christian Focus, and um, that would be the other uh, um, avenue. Christian Focus have published partly. Well, two. Two books. I, I was a chairman of the organization called SOLAS, the Center for Public Christianity. And as such, I edited two books for them. One on uh, um, why uh, why I am not an atheist. That was, that was the one thing. And secondly, on why we still believe and, and just uh, edited various essays, and, including my own, on these subjects. And then Christian Focus have also published a couple of things that I've tried to do for for younger, for sort of teenagers. Um, Messages from Grandad was the title of one of them. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, there was another called uh, Christianity, Is It True? Um, because I, I, I've always had the feeling that there are an awful lot of books, for Christian books for little children, um, but not enough. For people in the mid years, when they're yeah, You're right. you know tempted yeah. to sort of turn aside from the the things that they've learned in their earlier days, whether they went to Sunday school or not, um, and there, there's a great need for literature for for that age group. Yeah. So You're so a couple right. of things uh, with Christian Focus as well. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting because that's probably the age group where the world you know is assimilating you know yes. the most that they through social media and and yeah, exactly. all the other avenues where the volume is so loud so yeah i appreciate that yeah. what, what i'll do david i'll find the links to all of those books and i'll make sure that they're in the description so you, you know again you can check those out um do you have any plans to write anything else david in the future um i, I have nothing in the immediate uh, future but i i do have uh, one or two <laughs> beginnings of things one on on actually on on bible doubters to, to just take up uh, various aspects of that and the other thing that's been in my mind is something allowed, perhaps under the title be prepared um thinking about the need for christians and for the church to be ready for whatever lies ahead because it, yeah. it looks as if the the you know the, the gospel of the church is going to be under greater and greater pressure in our society and who knows whether days of persecution may lie ahead and and i think uh, there's a great need for for us to be prepared for for such eventualities so these are just a couple of other yeah. things that yeah. Uh, yeah. may or may not come to fruition yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well lord, lord willing we'll look forward to that david david yeah. thanks again for your time it's been it's been such a joy speaking with you this morning thank you well, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. It's been a, a joy to have fellowship with you.